Good morning and welcome to the ICS Live Facebook transmission. With it being the first Sunday in May, I'd just like to give you a heads up because we'll be taking virtual communion. Uh, we'll be sharing communion together over the internet. So uh, this is just a heads up to get the wine or juice and bread ready, which is ever appropriate for you and your family. Today we have a special guest. We have Stephen Heavey sharing a message that God has put on his heart. Stephen uh, is from Dublin, but now lives and works in South West Wales with his wife and his four children. I've known Stephen for 23 years. He's an evangelist. He's a man of God, a man of integrity and uh, a great friend. And I'm very privileged to have the honour of Stephen joining us and sharing a message that God has put on his heart. So God bless you, Stephen, and God bless us as we listen. Well, it's great to be with you all at the International Church of Skopje. I send greetings in Jesus' name. My name is Stephen Heavey. I live here in South Wales. Um, I moved here from Dublin, Ireland with my wife and four children. And this is where God has positioned us at this time. And today, um, Pastor Martin, your beautiful pastor, who I've known for over 20 years, we both went through a drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre together. And um, we grew together, we walked together, we cried together, we prayed together, we laughed together. We've had so many good times together. And uh, it's just been a privilege to be asked today to share with the fellowship there in uh, Skopje in Macedonia. You know, uh, last year when me and Martin were speaking about possibly coming to Skopje, obviously we couldn't get there this year, but we do plan to get to visit Macedonia, that beautiful country, and visit you all at Skopje eventually after this COVID-19. It's crazy times at this time. Nobody knows what's going to happen, but, you know, we can still fellowship together, even online. That is the beauty of technology and the wonder of technology and the fact that nothing can ever stop the fellowship of God's people. Isn't that amazing? I find it to be absolutely amazing that we can still encourage one another, strengthen one another and minister to one another. You know, I have to take my hat off to pastors week in, week out, even during the week, preparing messages and speaking into a computer. Because this is my first time actually speaking to a computer. I would shy away from this uh, very, very quickly and very easily because it's not the easiest thing to do. But at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about being able to speak a word in season to people and try to encourage them through this difficult time. And I pray this morning that you will all be encouraged. And if you're watching online or listening on, on, online, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, I ask that you will stay with me for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, as I want to talk about the greatest gift that has ever been given to mankind. Now, all of us as Christians will know straight away what that gift is, but what spurred me to think about the word gift was, this week has been a special week. It's been my wife's birthday. She still looks 21 years of age. She still does. I don't know how she does. I don't know what she's wearing. But she still looks very, very young, and I'm so blessed. And with her being a birthday, I had to think about what gift do I get my wife? Now, I don't know about you men out there, whether you struggle with gifts, but I struggle choosing gifts for my wife. It's just not my forte. I'm really, really bad at it. I'll get a gift. But sometimes I need to be told what gift to get. But, you know, over that week, as I began to think about, you know, my wife, I began to think about how much I valued my wife. And she has been with me and walked with me for over 20 years now. And um, about 20 years now. And we just really have grown all them years, through the years, and grown to love each other more. As we begin to understand and grow in our love with God. We realized that God was releasing a love through us for one another. And as I value, as I begin to think about the value of my wife, 
I began to think about the gift that I should get her. But also, I wanted to also get a gift that she would like, obviously. But basically, I wanted a gift that she would need. And that really prompted me to think about the value that God has for humanity and God has for you and for me. His love is absolutely enormous. So today, I just want to take the next few minutes to talk about the greatest gift. Now, the scripture I'm going to read from is one of the most famous scriptures in scripture, and it's John 3.16. Most people know it. You know, sometimes you'll see the word John 3.16 at football matches, you know, and people will often say, what does John 3.16 mean? Well, John 3.16 is a scripture in the Bible written by a man called John, who was an apostle of Jesus, a man who actually first was a disciple who walked with Jesus for three years as he done all of these miracles throughout Israel and around Jerusalem and Samaria. But today I want to really talk about what that gift means to me and you. You see, the Bible says that Jesus is the gift of God. And we want to try to unlock what that gift is. So as I read John 3.16, have a listen for a moment. Now John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever shall believe, believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life everlasting life. Now the two thoughts I simply want to leave with you today is two thoughts. One, that God loves humanity. And the second thought is that God is a giving God. Now many years ago when I first heard about the love of God and how God loves me, I was a heroin addict living on the streets and I used to sleep in a park underneath a tree and bushes. And I really, really had lost all respect and all self-respect and I, no dignity whatsoever. And when someone told me that God loved me, you know, I, I was so hard in my heart towards anyone loving me because of the situation I was in and the way I was living my life. I'd cut myself off from ever believing anything good about me or anyone else. And so when I heard first hear that God loved me, I thought, well, if there's a God, why am I in so much pain? Why is there so many wars because of religion? Why is there so much addiction and destruction? And why are so many people in this world broken and selfishness? I had all of these questions. And if God is so powerful and huge, why doesn't he just change everything? And it was only as I began to think about God and when I actually became a Christian, that all of these things really unfolded to me. Now, because God is powerful and awesome and magnificent, the Bible also says that God is holy. Now, John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world. God doesn't just love Christians. He doesn't just love people who are good. The Bible says that God so loved the world. Now, I want to take you back to the beginning of time when God created the world. And he created the perfect world. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 that after creating the world, he also had created, in Genesis 1, he first creates creation and he creates man and woman. But in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that, that God used to walk with Adam, the first man on earth and Eve in the cool of the day. That is an amazing concept to me today, whenever I say it, that God actually walked with man. He walked with Adam and God loved Adam. In fact, there's a great verse in Ephesians chapter two. And it says this by the apostle Paul in verse 10. It says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now that word workmanship is a wonderful word. It's a word that actually comes from the Greek word poemi, which we derive the word poem. Now, many years ago, when I'm putting this online and everyone's going to know now, 
but I'm just going to say it. But many years ago, when I first met Ashling, I wanted to really express how much I loved Ashling, and I, I really couldn't with words, really, you know. And I really wanted them to mean something, you know. And the only way I could actually do that was to actually write poetry. And I used to write these love poems, and I used to dig deep to try to find the right words and to express the right meaning, so that when she read it, she would feel a sense of how much I loved her. Now, God, you see, when he was creating man, the Bible says that God basically took the innermost expression of his heart. Now, this is the God who has no beginning and no end, the eternal God who fills everything in every way. He digs deep into the very essence of his being and he brings forth what we know as mankind. This was the express, the innermost expression of God was man himself. He absolutely loved this creation. He loved this creation. He loved Adam and he loved Eve. And he would walk with them and he would pour out his love to them as they walked in the garden. Now, the Bible tells us that, you know, God, obviously, he wanted them to, to willingly love him back. He wanted them to reciprocate the fact that he was loving on them and he wanted them to willingly love them back. And the best way I can explain this is that when they were in Eden, there was two trees in particular. They could eat from any of the trees in the garden. But there was two particular trees. One was called the knowledge of good and evil. And the second tree was called the tree of life. And as they ate from the tree of life and walked with God, they would continue to live and live and live and live. But if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Bible, God had told them that you will shall surely die. Meaning they would be cut off from fellowship, this close communion with God. And from then on would begin to die and deteriorate. But not only would they die, the Bible would say that as they would bring forth children, because their nature had changed, their nature had become sinful. Sin had now entered into the world. And the way sin entered into the world was because there was a serpent in the garden. Now, lots of people tried to say it was a snake rolling around the grass. But basically, I don't know what this being looked like. We know him to be the devil. He may have been in a, even in a white suit. I don't know. But he comes to Eve and he tells Eve, this serpent, this character of a serpent, this snake, comes and he deceives Eve into eating from this tree. And because she ate from that tree and Adam ate from the tree, Basically, they were cut off from God and sin entered into the world. Now, basically, sin is the reason why so much evil is in the world. So much wickedness and selfishness is in the world. A man is born into sin because of that, of no fault of their own. We're all born sinners now because of that one choice. And that's why even in our lives, choices still do matter today. Even for us as believers, we know that we are secure in God. We know that he'll love us to the end and we have a, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But even our choices do have, you know, whether good, you know, rewards or bad rewards, you know, whatever way you want to take it. There are, there are basically consequences to all of our choices. And there was a massive consequence to Adam and Eve's choice because this is what the Bible actually says. And it explains it a lot better than I could ever explain it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Let me read it again. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, sin entered the world through one man, one man's choice, and that was Adam. It came in, that's when sin first came into the world, into creation and into man. And death through sin. So basically what the Bible is telling us, that when sin came into the world, death came to all men. So basically all man is born to die. But not only that, sin has terrible consequences. Even in our day-to-day -day lives, the choices we make. And we only have to look at the way the world is, how broken society is. Humanity is broken. Humanity is shut down. It's broken and it's hopeless at times. But even though humanity is broken, 
God still desired that perfect and complete fellowship that he once had with Adam. You see, Adam wasn't born perfect. Because if Adam was perfect, he would have never sinned. But he was born innocent. But that innocence now was now lost. And our innocence is lost from the day that we step foot into this world. The moment we're born, we are born sinners. The Bible actually said that, you know, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, simply saying that God had a perfect standard. And none of us, no man on this planet could ever reach that standard because we're all born sinners. But God's love for us was so massive. It was so huge. He loved man. He loved us so much that God had orchestrated a plan to bring his son into the world. Because the Bible actually tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If you go back in time to the nation of Israel, they had to offer once a year animals to be sacrificed to cover over their sins. Once a year that would happen. They would have their sins covered. And that was, all, that was just to reveal what God was going to do in the future. Because the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, by the Apostle Paul again, that when the time had fully come, God sent his son who was born of a virgin. That's incredible news. The Bible says that this is the gospel news. It means it's, it's good news. And I always say it's good news for bad people like me. But God had a plan from the beginning that he would bring his son into this world to redeem you and to redeem me and bring us back, not just to make us innocent before him, but to bring us back into perfect, perfect fellowship with him. A fellowship where, where sin could never, no longer discommunicate us from fellowship and this romance that we would have with God. It would be a perfected work done through Jesus Christ. So God sends his son into this world through a virgin called Mary 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit would come and would plant the God seed inside this young virgin. And she brought forth this child who was the son of God to live a perfect, perfect life free from sin. And the Bible says that when he grew up to 30 years of age, he began his ministry on this planet. And he began to go around speaking about the coming kingdom. And he was speaking about the love of his father. But also he was telling people that him and the father were one. And God's desire was not just to have him and the father be one. He wanted us to be one also with him and the Father. But the only way the Bible tells us that that could happen is that Jesus would lay down his life for me and for you. Because we could not gain access back to God, even on our best day. You could do everything right in this life, but it still wouldn't be good enough to be accepted by God. And the only thing that could be accepted by God was the perfect sacrifice of the life of Jesus. And scripture tells us that Jesus died for us 2,000 years ago on a cross on a hill called Calvary. This is the most moving scenario. This was an innocent man, the God-man. He was the darling of heaven. And the Bible says that they took this innocent man and they cast accusation against him because they hated him. They hated who he represented. They couldn't believe that he was God's son, but they knew he was doing all of these miracles and they hated the idea of him being God's son, but he was. And because these evil men, they took him, the very hands that he created, they took him and they tortured him all through the night. The Bible says that they took whips with lumps of bone and, and stone, sharp edged stone on a cord and would lash him and lash him and rip open his skin, pull out his beard. They would hit him with clubs. They would spit on him. They would revile him. And he took all of that. And then the Bible tells us that they took him to a hill 
and they put nails, nails into his hands and nails into his feet. And then they lifted him up on a cross where he couldn't even breathe, where his lungs began to fill up with water and blood. But he did this, the Bible says, willingly for you and for me. That's why the Bible describes Jesus as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Because as I mentioned to you, they offered, the Jewish nation offered sacrifices once a year. And the blood of those animals would be offered for the covering of their sin. But the Bible says that Jesus would die for the sins of the world. He didn't just die for the sins of those who would believe him. He actually died for the sin of the world. I and mean, Jesus was God's gift to you and to me so that we could have that perfect fellowship with him again. And also go on after we die, we will be really begin to live and live in the kingdom where he is at the center in a perfect world. But you see, we have to actually receive that gift. Like if I come to your door and I ring the bell. And I have a gift in my hand and I want to give you this gift. And I say, look, here's a gift. It's an unconditional gift. I don't want you to give me anything back. I don't want you to do anything for this gift. Here's a gift. In order for you to get the benefits of that gift, you would have to take that gift from me. And sometimes all these questions will come into our head when we're taking a gift from someone who are telling us there's not, you know, I don't want anything back. The moment sometimes we receive a gift and we have it and we look at it, we sometimes are always thinking, you know, I'd better buy them a gift. <laughs> I have to get busy thinking about what to buy them. But God wasn't like that. You see, the gift that God gave to us was not something that we could actually outdo. This was a gift that was priceless. It could never be earned. It could never, you know, you could never work for this gift. No amount of goodness could help us to receive this gift. This was a free gift for you and for me. Now I want to read a gift. This is what the Bible said. The reason why God gave us this gift is revealed to us in Romans chapter 5 again. And it's in verses 6 to 8. And I want to read these scriptures to you today. For while we were still helpless, me and you could not find our way back to God. Only Jesus could build a bridge to bring us back to him but for while we were still helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly which is you and me for one will hardly die for a righteous man though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die but God demonstrates his own love towards us God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners while we were sinners Jesus died for you and for me. I can remember the days where I sat underneath that tree, waking up sick from my addiction of heroin. And I remember during the mornings, in the cold mornings, I remember praying simple little prayers. Please God, just help me, take me out of this world, whatever needs to be, do something in my life, I'm going to die like that, I don't want to die like this. But if I am, do it quickly. I, I had all these different players, but I always believed this day now that God was looking at me and he was seeing my pain and he was seeing my hurt and he was listening to my prayers, even then, a sinner. And it was, wasn't long then before someone offered me the gift of Jesus. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians also in chapter 2, in verses 8 and 9. He says it's for for grace you have it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, but it is a gift from God. You see, the word grace, people have all these concepts. Gee, grace is not a concept or an idea. Grace, the Bible tells us, is what we understand to be the unmerited favor of God. It's a it's a favor from God. That me and you could never earn. And so many of us as Christians. We, we, we grab hold of that. To first become Christians. But we never realise that. As through the years. We, we, we keep trying to. 
pay back God for everything he did. And in fact, what we're doing is we're actually going against the very purpose of what Jesus did. He wanted us to enjoy this gift freely and without conditions. He offered himself to you unconditionally because of his great love for you, because he knew that we could not save ourselves from this present world. He knew that we needed him to bring us through. And grace, the word grace means God's unmerited favour towards you. Now, what, who or what is God's favour? Well, the Bible says in Titus 2.11, it tells us that for the grace of God has been revealed to all men. Now, it does go on to say, teaching us to say no to all ungodliness and worldly pleasures. But just the first half of that verse the grace of God has re been revealed to all men. Now, who has been revealed to all men? Jesus has. You see, grace is not a theology or a concept that we can construct in our minds. Grace is a person. And that person is Jesus. And Jesus so loved me and you that he was willing to give up his place in heaven. To come and to live amongst us. The Bible says in 1 John. and John 1 verse 14. That God made his dwelling among us. He came as a man. The Bible says he was tempted just like me and you. But he was sinless. He lived that perfect life. And then he willingly gave up that life. For you and for me. That is the great story of redemption that God loved you and me today I want to offer this same gift that was offered to me over 20 years ago I want to offer that same gift to you if you feel prompted in your heart as you're listening to this message if you feel lost and lonely in a world that is so troubled there's a reason for your existence and there's a reason why you can feel so lonely. I remember the great Billy Graham once said, great evangelist speaker, he said that there's a, a vacuum in the heart of man, an emptiness, but he said it's a God-shaped vacuum. You see, we weren't made for nothing. We weren't made without any reason. There was a reason for us being brought into this world. There's a reason for us to live life. And there's a reason to go on living after our physical death. And that reason was Jesus. Today, I offer you, or God offers you, the greatest gift that you could ever know. God's only son. That son has the power to break any addiction, to break any sin, any stranglehold over your life. The amount of people I know through the years who have made him their Lord and Saviour, who have come to a knowledge of him, who have become one with him. The amount of people that I know who have come, given their lives to Jesus Christ and allowed his life to become their life. Many of them were in prostitution, drug addiction, alcoholism. These things that the world would say they're, they're basically you know, unable. Like one, they'll say things like once an addict, always an addict. But that ain't true. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. And the old is gone and the new has come. Basically what God is saying is God wants to give you a new heart and a new spirit so that you can fellowship with him perfectly and perfect communion with God today. I pray today that you will come to the realisation that you were made for one reason. To be loved by God. God loves you. And God loves me. And God cares for you today. Believer, if you're, if you're a believer already, you know what the love of God is. But I pray that you will grow in the knowledge of God's love. You know, Paul the Apostle said in the book of Ephesians, I pray that you may know the height, the length, the depth, and the breadth of the love of God. He gives the love of God four dimensions. Now, we know everything has three dimensions in this world. 
But God's love had a fourth dimension. It was a love that we could not understand with our own fallible minds. This is God's love. It's a love, the Bible says, that conquers all things, that helps us to overcome in every struggle, in every fight that we face in this world. It helps us to trust Him when the world looks like it can't trust anybody. We know where the source of our strength comes from. It comes from our Maker, the Maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you're a believer today, I pray that you are encouraged to keep trusting Him through these difficult times. I pray that you will know the the greatest love, a deeper revelation of the greatest love of God in your heart today. And if you do not know him today, I pray that you will make that simple choice to follow Jesus, to accept that he, God the Father, gave up everything for you, that you may know life, but you may know it to the full. Your life may be empty today, You may feel like you have no direction. You may feel like you have no meaning. You may feel like you have no purpose. But God so loved you that he says to you today that you are his poemy. You are the innermost expression, the innermost expression of God's heart. That is a wonderful thing to know. God loves you and he cares for you. He cares for us. And he loves his church. But not only does he love his church, God so loves the world. We need to keep telling people about Jesus. We need to stop condemning people. We need to stop judging people. We need to release the message inside of our hearts. If we've been loved by him, then we must go and love as he has loved us, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, uh, Stephen, for that uh, wonderful message and that reminder that God so loved the world. And uh, it's a good time now as we come to the table uh, to reflect on our week, to reflect on the things that we may have done and said that have not brought glory to God. So uh, before we enter in, uh, the Bible tells us not to partake in communion in an unworthy manner. So I pray, Father God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would search our hearts and minds, that we may confess and be cleansed before you. The Bible tells us on the night he was betrayed, uh, Jesus, he, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's given up for you. And he took the cup, the wine, and he said, this is my blood that is being poured out for you. So we thank you, Lord, for these emblems which represent your body and your blood that was shed for us. So we thank you. I would encourage you also to take communion at home. Uh, You don't have to wait uh, once a month for our service, I'm sure. that you're aware of that. But I would encourage you uh, to take communion at home and together as a family and uh, not not forget this uh, wonderful uh, opportunity where we can connect directly uh, with the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, Stephen, once again for taking time out to uh, video record a message, speaking into a camera, a laptop or computer certainly is a challenge uh, for an evangelist that's used to a large audience and interacting uh, with people. So thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Uh, We look forward to the time when you're able to come to ICS uh, with your wife, Ashley, 
hopefully that would be sooner than later so thank you so very much for your message and I'd like to uh, close uh, the service uh, uh, in prayer and benediction so uh, let us pray for, for God so loved in your saving love you give us grace for this we give you thanks and as one body offer ourselves and each other as we pray for God so loved the world we pray for the world around us the nations for the people far and near for their hopes for their fears and for those who weep and for those who dance in every part of the world we pray for God so loved the world that he gave we give you thanks for the possibilities that come from your imagination for the talents and gifts that you've freely given us and we pray that we will fulfill the vision of ministry, mission and the plans and purposes that you prepared for us in advance. For God so loved the world that he gave the only one and only begotten Son. We give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came amongst us to teach us how to live. And in you we live and have our being. In this season of COVID-19, we, we, we just pray for your purposes to prevail in suffering that people will turn their faces and humble themselves and cry out to you and that you would answer them, we pray. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whomsoever believes in him. We pray for ICS and for Macedonia and for all the nations that are represented it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomever believes in him shall not perish we praise for those who are suffering show us how we may help them those in our families and communities who do not know you yet for those who are hurting and are rejected and for those who are trusting us to pray for them we pray for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life we pray for those who are sick, for the people who are grieving and suffering, that they may know the presence of Jesus Christ uh, through the Holy Spirit. And we pray uh, for them, especially this day, that you would reach out by your power and touch them, we pray. We pray that you bless for those who are mourning and for those in their grief. Uh, and uh, we know for sure that certain steadfast promises of our eternal life that are in you, in Christ Jesus. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but in, not, in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. I would like to, uh, for us all to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the, the, power, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I uh, hope you have a great week. I'd just like to uh, close with a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.